and Ghost Towns with Mike Roberts and Bill Barley. Welcome to another edition of Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. I'm Mike Roberts with Bill Barley, our uh, resident expert when it comes to uh, gold trails, ghost towns, former school teacher, placer miner, author. But did you ever get rich, Bill? I've been on good th three good strikes, Mike, but that's, um, that's not always rich in the, in the placer fields. And that's probably another story. It is indeed. We have done things now from the Silvery Spokane to Dawson, but where are we going today? Where are we going to look at today? One of my favorite areas, Mike, although it's, 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 it's been in the decline for the last, I would think, at least 80 years, and it's an old town called Yale, once the metropolis of the Fraser River. And Yale, of course, was one of the earliest of the gold towns on the Fraser River Rush. This was in 1858. And it was the head of navigation, so the sternwheelers came up to Yale, and because of that, Yale became a bustling boom town and lasted that way right through the 1850s, right into the 1860s, went into a period of decline, and then when the railroad started to build through the canyon, the Canadian Pacific came back into a, into the spotlight for a few brief years and then declined again. But it's the story of those prospectors going to the Caribou Gold Fields that sets this story up. Basically. Okay. Come back in just a second and we'll talk about the town of Yale on the Fraser River and tell some great stories. We'll be back in just a second. Uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, yeah. but this, we're going right back to the origins of British Columbia with our talk about Yale today. Yeah, essentially why British Columbia became a crown colony and later a province. So we're talking about the Fraser River Gold Rush, which started in 1858, uh, you know, really got it, it, its impetus then. It probably started in 57, Mike, but because of the Fraser River Gold Rush, a string of towns built up, first up the Fraser, and then eventually into the Caribou. Now, the Fraser was the primary route for the prospector to go. This was the highway of the early, 1800 and early 1860s and late 1850s. So, in other words, the stern wheelers came up from New Westminster, across from Victoria, into New Westminster, and then, of course, up the Fraser, right up to, originally up to Fort Hope, and then it made the jump from Fort Hope to Fort Yale. Fort Yale became the head of navigation. All right. This is, the first shot is of the kind of man that made his livelihood there. And this is the man after whom uh, all these stories of gold trails and ghost towns are, of course, named. Who's this man? Who do you this think is, this man is? This is a typical miner of the 1850s, a painting by Hind. And uh, it shows him with his gold pan and with the various other things he needs, the miner's pick and the boots and so on. He's looking in the pan for color. And, of course, this is the, the typical view that the average individual thought of as the miner, the lonely prospector looking for, for gold in some, some forgotten stream from somewhere. This is sort of a, a romantic artist conception of him, or was this a, a did that miner commission Hind to paint him? It's both. It's both. It is, it was, as far as we know, we don't know the individual in, in, in the painting, but it is kind of a romantic view, but a typical view as well. We, so much of the work at this time was done by artists, and some of it was not particularly accurate art. Who's the man who did this? This is an example. We don't know the individual who did this. This was done for Harper's Magazine in 1858, the earliest known view of Yale. But he was not there, Mike. Yeah. There's another picture uh, that he that did on second. this of Fort Langley, but, and it was accurate, but this picture of Yale is not accurate, and you'll see that. You can see the background in this particular picture. You can see the fort itself. But the fort was not like that, nor is the background like that, nor is the forefront down by the river like that. So it wasn't nice and straight where you see all those tents lined up? No, it wasn't. It wasn't that kind of a fort that's got sort of a, uh, uh, a caisson at each end of the, no. of the wall? No. Okay, who is the man who did this for Harper's? We don't know. It's okay. just one of the Harper's artists. And uh, he spelled Fraser wrong. This is the first, one of the first photographs. This gives you a better look. Yes, it does. And it shows how, how incorrect the, the view by Harper's artist was. Although Harper's was a good magazine. This is low water, is it? This is low water. Probably, uh, probably early fall in 1858-59. Shows the fort on the left-hand side. Shows way beyond, just in the, in the defile of the canyon there, Lady Franklin's Rock. And this is Yale 
as a burgeoning, booming gold town. One of the stern wheelers is at Steamboat Landing, and uh, this is the way Yale would have looked if you'd walked in there in the late 1850s. Got an artifact here that is from the days of placer mining on the, on the uh, Fraser River. What is this? Well, that came, that's a Chinese uh, copper amalgam plate. It came from an old Chinese store on Front Street in Yale, and the Chinese miners used this when they were mining Hills Bar. And Hills Bar was one of the famous bars of the Fraser River. About two tons, at least two tons of gold came off Hills Bar. And it was mined for about 40 years after the rush. So it started in 1858. The Chinese miners were still mining Hills Bar in the 1880s, Mike. And the reason they had this is that they put this in the bottom of their rocker because they were short of water, surprisingly, so they had to use it up on the bar. So they set up a rocker, two men used it, and this was a copper amalgam plate. And because, and it was covered with mercury, because mercury has an affinity with gold, mm -hmm. it was, the mercury was put on top and all the gravel would come over this plate in the rocker and the, the, the mercury itself would attract the gold or alloy with it and you would have uh, the mercury covering this plate and at the end of a week or whatever it was, the Chinese would, would blow off the mercury and just take the gold. They, they had a way of separating the mercury Certainly from the gold, yeah. and all gravel and all other dirt would just float off That's the right. mercury, and, would, and it would stay here despite the fact it that... It would, until it became overloaded with gold, but they would know that. Now, as I'm looking across this, I'm seeing little glints. Is, is there... Well, actually, there is gold in this. This is the original mercury, and it was in this bag, and the Chinese had not, for some reason, blown this mercury off. So if this, if this could be, you could recover a certain amount of gold from this plate. Now, where would you find a plate like this? Is this found in an old Chinese store on Front Street in Yale many years ago? I bought a whole collection out of Yale off a very fine man. I paid some thousands of dollars for his collection, and this was part of the collection. I got about 15 of these plates in the carrying bags. Gosh, the carrying bags are neat. So these these uh, bags go back to that same era, and they with the rope and everything attached. Those to bags them. are about a hundred years old. Well, I'll be careful of these. Or even older. Now, the, of course, the the thing which the miners, I guess, dreaded, maybe gold doesn't allow you to dread anything, but going up that Fraser Canyon, how did the miner get from Yale up the Fraser Canyon? Well, it was, it was very, very difficult. They had to go overland by little used game trails and so on because this was prior to the Caribou Road. And so they went through the big canyon. And if you read the original accounts and all the old newspapers, the, the Victoria Gazette and the colonists and so on, literally probably at least 200 miners drowned in the Fraser River in the first two years of the gold rush, 58 and 59. And most of them drowned around Yale between, between Hope and probably Lillooet. So Yale and north of Yale and just south of Yale. The, the, river, the Fraser River is a very treacherous river. And these guys, it was easier to go up the river than come down the river, because when you come down the river, you're out of control. Yeah. So did they try and canoe up the canyon here? They or would try, raft no, up actually, the... they wouldn't try and canoe up the canyon. They would go overland up the canyon, and some of them tried to shoot the canyon coming down, and of course, this is, this is a very hazardous operation. Over 200, around 200 Around miners. 200, yeah. These are the guys who did it. These are the guys who got right into the caribou itself, and this is the Muchuaro on, on Williams Creek. And this is probably taken in 1863 or 64, somewhere in the 1860s. And the gold that was collected on these great mines on Williams Creek and Lightning Creek and all the famous creeks of the Caribou mm -hmm. would come down by express company. Now, there were a number of express companies. The first express man was Billy Ballou, the colorful Billy Ballou. He was driven to the ground by the remorseless competition of his, of his rivals. And so he, he disappeared, but in his place came a number of other companies. Barnard's Express, and Barnard's Express carried the treasure or the gold from the Caribou Gold Fields down to, right down to Yale. And then from Yale down to New Westminster, it would be carried by Dietz and Nelson. Uh, in fact, they would sometimes carry it right over to Victoria. And then from Victoria, the famous firm of Wells Fargo. And they would send it, transship it to San Francisco. It was big business. There are lots of shippers, lots of money to sure. be made in the gold fields. And they would get a percentage of all the gold they shipped to the gold fields, Mike. This is a remarkable little scale here. What was this for? That came, that's a provisioner scales for weighing furs and everything. Mm -hmm. And that was from, originally from Fort Yale. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, it's, it's, it's typical of the day. The scales was probably 1830s, I would think, because Fort Yale was an active fort only for a few years until the gold rush started and then it came back into the limelight again. 
This, I think I had it on backwards there, but this, yeah. that's that's the way it sort of would work. Approximately, yes. And then that would be where you'd hang the the, the goods you're buying, that's and that right. would be the counterweight out there. That's correct. Yeah. Remarkable. Where did yeah, you yeah. pick these? I mean, were these well, standard? Well, the, 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 this particular scales came from that original collection I purchased from old Gus Milliken. Interesting stuff. Yeah. Okay. The below the can, now, the canyon itself. How long did it take them for? to stop this business of going up and down the Fraser uh, on the water? Well, you see, what happened is that the, 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 until 1863, there was another route through, through, through Port Douglas, but they finally found that route was too expensive, it was laborious, it was time consuming, so they built the second Caribou Road. This, we're looking now at a picture of the second Caribou Road. This was started in 1863, Snake through the canyon, and Snake passed various obstacles that were very daunting. The, the, the Colonel's Retreat, Jackass Mountain, where one step would consign you to a watery grave very, very rapidly, Mike. And so they had to build extremely carefully. Royal Engineers built a lot of this road, blasting out foot by foot, coming up through the, the, the depths of the big canyon, and then going up, up the Thompson, and then overland from the Thompson up through Cache Creek, up through Clinton, and eventually into the Caribou Gold Fields. They arrived there in 1865. They didn't do a lot of blasting in some places. They built it right out on bridges out of the cliff face. Oh, sure they that. did. Here's one of the express companies you're talking yes, about. Yes, that's a later shot. This is the BC Express, which took over from Barnard's Express. This is a shot taken out of Ashcroft, probably in the 1880s, the early 1880s. And the, the stagecoach there is an Abbott and Downing coach, and uh, um, some with some provisions made for the rough rides in British Columbia, so they would add uh, further strength of the Abbott and Downings. They were customized from the kind that went across the United States, but it's essentially an American stagecoach with a heavier gear. Essentially it is, yeah. The Bank of British Columbia. This is the first Bank of British Columbia. This shot was probably taken in 1863. It might have been a little later. It's hard to tell. Um, and this is in Yale itself, right on Front Street. And this was one of the banks that received the treasure from the gold fields. So there would be the Bank of British Columbia and several other banks. Do you have any observation of what might be in that very strange-looking wagon? I mean, it looks like it's it's carrying a statue or some sort of strange wellhead gear or something. Well, it's hard, it's hard to tell. It could be mining equipment or, or mining machinery, and quite possibly it is. And this is certainly after the Caribou Road was built, Mike, because that, road, that wagon is ready to go up the Caribou Road. Yeah. This is the point where we begin to get to another treasure story. This drawing, we saw a drawing earlier that was pretty inaccurate. This drawing was done by whom, and it's pretty accurate. This is done by an artist called O'Brien, and it's, it's, a very, uh, it's a very accurate drawing of Yale and, and, the, and, the, and the mountains beyond and so on. This is 1880s. You can see the railroad track on the left-hand side. But it does show that some of the steering wheelers were still coming to Yale at that time. And the story we're concerned with is about 20 years earlier, Mike. Okay, so around about 1860, a stern wheeler comes up just as that one did, yeah. just up the river. It docks at what place? It docks at, at Steamboat Landing. Yeah. And in fact, if you went down to Steamboat Landing today, Mike, you would still see the old ring boats anchored in the rocks. They're still there at Yale. Very, very interesting, moody spot. And you can see where the old stern wheelers were pulling on these ring boats because they're worn through practically. And so the, what happened was this. Is the, the story's rather interesting. And the story concerns the one of the express companies, Dietz and Nelson. Yeah. And Dietz and Nelson was the intermediary between Bernard's Express and Wells Fargo. And so a shipment came in from the Caribou, and it was, it was a shipment of about 20 pounds of gold. And that would probably be specie and, and uh, nuggets and What's, so on. What specie? Specie would be coins and so on, you see. So there might be some California stuff in there some California private mint gold, yeah. and there probably was. And there was, there, there was certainly some American gold, some ordinary American gold pieces, and some gold, probably some nuggets and so on. And it came in an express bag like this. Let's have a look at this. This is, do you know if this is in fact a Dietz and Nelson bag or? Uh... Well, this is, this is either Bernard's Express or a Dietz and Nelson. This was, this came out of Yale. It's uh, probably 1860s, and this was the typical treasure pouch that they would transfer from the bank right onto the stern wheeler itself. And there's double-sided, double it would right. sit over the back of your horse, yep. of course, and they'd have bags That's put right. in here sure filled with the gold. Yeah, filled with gold. Okay, so I'm sitting on the side of the Fraser River. There's a steamer coming up, and who am I? And you're just a bystander. Yep. What has happened is something is going to unfold before your eyes, and this is what happens. The, the individual of the Dietz and Nelson's agent in, in, in this particular area, and it may have been Higgins, it may not have been, but he, he forgot to put the treasure bag on board a steamer called the Reliance. 
and the reliance was ready to pull away he suddenly remembers he grabs